small holders, strategies for food security. And uh, to lead this, uh, Sean DeClean, Vice President of GAR International is here. Hey, Sean, how are you? I, uh, I had heard a lot about Sean DeClean, but I hadn't met him until I was in uh, Accra at the Accra Forum last uh, September. And there I uh, saw his leadership and ability demonstrated for the first time. And he is a dynamic uh, leader of panels like this. His work at GARA, the world's leading supplier of mineral, fer mineral fertilizers, and a company that's playing a major role in promoting the Green Revolution in Africa, is uh, uh, extremely impressive. He's deeply involved as a leader in the growth and trade corridors in Southern Africa and in collaborations to promote agricultural investment through entities like Africa Progress Panel and the World Economic Forum, which is New Vision of Agriculture, which is meeting here this week. Please welcome Sean DeClean and his panel. Thank you very much, everyone. It is uh, the last time I stood in front of an audience was, uh, as uh, Ambassador Quinn was saying, at the African Green Revolution Forum in Ghana, uh, which was the first time that Africa had held an event of uh, this scale and nature uh, to, to look at the whole role of uh, farming and how that can be developed in Africa. So it's, uh, it, this is a different place flying over uh, this was my first time that I'd uh, been to Des Moines, so flying over the plane coming into Des Moines and you're looking at all this perfect, uh, neatly arranged agriculture was very different to the flight into Ghana. And, um, uh, but uh, it's still, I think the, uh, the synergies and the harmonies between these uh, two events are very powerful and I was very honoured to have the opportunity to be involved here. So joining me on stage are leaders from uh, diverse backgrounds, from the corporate sector, from government, from international organisations and a farm leader in her own right. And it's fitting to have this, this, this diversity on the stage as we discuss partnering on strategies for food security, which at this point in time is of critical importance. Uh, particularly as we look at volatility in the in the global food price, and you know the the people that will be most impacted if that has a negative impact will be smallholder farmers, often in sort of remote parts of the world. And my, myself, I lived in Malawi for six years and in Africa for 12 years, so this is something I'm very familiar with. Gabriella Cruz is from an 800 hectare um, family crop and livestock farm. Uh, the Isabella, Isabella Cruz and uh, Sisters Farm, and has, which has been in the family for over a hundred years. Um, Miss Cruz is the president of the Portuguese Association for Soil Con Conservation and represented Portuguese farmers at the European Union Commission for eight years. She participated in this week's uh, Global Farmer to Farmer Roundtable and yesterday was announced as the winner of the 2010 Kleckner Award. Uh, for advancing trade and technology for global farmers. And uh, Jose Fernandez is the US uh, Assistant Secretary for State, uh, who many of you know, who's been in the role for I think nine months now, is that right? Uh, for economic energy and business affairs, uh, who oversees State Department's efforts on international trade and investment finance and global energy uh, security, but probably most importantly for this discussion on development of agriculture. Uh, and his uh, bureau is very involved in the Feed the Future initiative, which we've heard quite a bit about uh, over the last couple of days, and seems to be really gaining momentum. Mr. Fernandez himself has legal experience that includes three decades of practice in Latin America, Europe and Africa, as economies in those regions have evolved. So if we could just warmly welcome uh, Mr. Fernandez. And then until last month, uh, Matt uh, Kistler was the Senior Vice President of Sustainability for Walmart, uh, leading the company's global sustainability strategy and engaging the company's 100,000 suppliers and more than 2 million associates worldwide towards these goals. He's now the Vice President of Marketing 
uh, so has big shoes to step into, but he's a tall guy, so I think uh, he'll do fine. As he continues to work on the company's linkages with diverse food producers through tall, uh, throughout the entire value chain. And then Robert Singler, who many of you know, is the Director General of ERI, the International Rice Research Institute, which is part of the, one of the flagship centres of CGAIR, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, uh, which this year is marking its 50th uh, anniversary for taking cutting-edge uh, agricultural research and improved crop and production technologies through to the, to the farm at, the, uh, right, at, at all levels internationally. A plant specialist uh, in his own right with experience in the Congo and the Burundi. He's also worked and led programs with CJIR uh, SEAT in uh, Colombia prior to leading IRI, which as many of you know is headquartered in the Philippines. So, partnering smallholders to achieve something significant in terms of food security. Now this is something that we've been engaging in for a long time now, but I think particularly since 2008 there has been a renewed focus on what this means, to engage literally billions of smallholder farmers around the world into and bring them comprehensively into the value chain has required us to, in many ways, what a, from where I stand, coming from the private sector side of things, is probably an unprecedented level of congruence and willingness to try and find solutions to these partnerships that will engage smallholder farmers and take that to scale at a much more significant level. So we're seeing new kinds of partnership models, we're seeing alliances being developed, we're seeing much more engagement between government, international organisations, the private sector, farmers, both medium, small and large scale farmers and civil society. So, just very quickly, we're going to do this in the form of a sort of discussion. I'm not going to ask people to give uh, 10 minute speeches, so just, uh, so just very quickly, I mean, from your representative perspectives, if maybe I could just ask you just, you know, to, in, in one or two minutes, just to say, what is it that's changed, you know, from the previous decades, you know, and how are we going to continue that change in terms of the way we do farming, the way we partner? Well, uh, hello to everybody. I would like to uh, thank the um, um, organization of this uh, Borlo Dialogue and Truth About Trade and Technology Association, who both invited me to, to be here and share my experience. Um, from my uh, experience with farming, so I've been managing the farm for 20 years, uh, and um, I, I was brought on a farm so I could see what my uh, parents were doing. The par partnership between various um, associations, farmers, uh, enterprises, research institutes are very important. And they are so important that uh, I can give you an example of what we uh, did and are doing in my country. Um, at one point, uh, we, uh, we were allowed to grow sugar beet in uh, Portugal. We didn't know the crop, we had no idea to grow it, and we were on the hands of the uh, company who bought the produce, our produce uh, from our farms. And what we did with the association of sugar beet pro um, producers was we did a, an experimental um, association between the industry and the farmers, in order that we could select the best varieties and the best adapted varieties of sugar beet uh, for the country. And it was so successful that in two years we doubled our production. Doubled? In two we years? Doubled. It's, uh, sometimes I feel a bit 
uh, some fear to say that it's two years because me, many people might not know why is that. The thing is, um, the industry was pushing us some old varieties they were wanting. They were not the best performance. So we could bring the, uh, the experience of Spanish and Italian farmers and the adoption and adaptation of the varieties of, to our country was much quicker because we had other countries' experience uh, with those varieties because they had the same climate and soil conditions. So in two years we were, we started with a, at a very low level, level, we were doing 35 tons per hectare and in two years we reached what the Spanish and Italians were doing, which is 70 uh, tons. That's why we could be so quick. But we have a partnership like uh, this one. It's very exciting. I'm going to come back to this, but uh, I, I'm just going to do a quick uh, quick thing because I think these kinds of examples are, are very impressive. And what's, in, what's exciting there is also the interaction. This wasn't just done in Portugal, you know, as an association with, you know, the research institutes and, and the industry, but you were also looking at this from a, a cross-country perspective as well and sharing that knowledge. So, but let me ask Matt, I mean, Walmart, I'm sure you would say they've changed a lot in the last decade in terms of what are some of the, the, the ways in which you've seen that change significantly? Well, um, first of all, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. It's, uh, we had our own kind of sustainable agriculture meeting today as well, but, um, in the broadest sense, um, we've been on a journey now on sustainability for about five years, and uh, certainly the opportunities that we have as a corporation to make a true difference to better serve the more than 200 million people who come through our doors every week um, is amazing, and something that we think is a true responsibility that we have as a corporation. Um, we have three basic sustainability goals that we have um, as a company now uh, integrated globally into every area of the company. And those uh, three broad goals are to be supplied 100% by renewable energy, to create zero waste, and to sell products that sustain people and the environment. And today, uh, we made nine new goals as a corporation that our CEO announced uh, globally. Uh, we had about 1,000 people in our conference room uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas. We were also uh, webcast into our 15 countries where we have operations, and certainly a lot of external media also witnessed um, our event this morning. Uh, but we made several. Um, so the World Food Prize are a good, good company when they webcast the World Food Prize out. Absolutely. But anyway, keep going. But we made uh, several commitments today, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we made nine new commitments around sustainable agriculture. And one of those is to source a um, billion dollars worth of merchandise, uh, agricultural merchandise, from a million uh, small and medium-sized farmers globally. But we also backed it up with um, uh, providing training uh, to more than a million farmers from which we buy from now in uh, many countries, including the United States, directly from. And so those are just two of the goals that were made today that I think um, not only show our commitment, but as a corporation, I hope um, people are starting, to, are starting to realize that sustainability uh, for Walmart, sustainability um, as a business strategy is a good one. And certainly the, um, the value we're seeing not only is financial, but obviously too has tremendous um, environmental and social benefits as well. Robert, I'm going to just follow on. And so, I mean, listening to this, you're, you're seeing two different sides of the private sector. The, the small farm, you know, well, it's not a small farm that you're on, Gabriella, but I mean, you know, you're, you're not on the Iowa sort of scale of farming, and, and, and then from a Walmart perspective. But from a research institute, I mean, this has been something you've probably been wanting to see for a long time, haven't this? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, when, when we look at uh, your question, what has changed, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is what has not changed. And that is that uh, we still have uh, the vast majority of the world's rice being uh, supplied by very small farmers. We have 200 million rice farms in, in Asia alone. Uh, now, in terms of what has been changing, I think this is, uh, is extremely exciting from a research institute perspective. 
Uh, and that is we're seeing farmers having access to, uh, to tools of communication unlike they've ever had, ever had before. We've heard uh, a number of speakers uh, over the last couple of days uh, repeatedly bring up uh, the uh, prevalence of cell phone technology. And I think that, that means of communication is something that will completely revolutionize uh, small order production at a global level. Um, we look at, we've heard a lot about seed uh, production uh, and how new seeds can, can revolutionize uh, production systems around the world. Jeff Riggs mentioned some of our flood tolerant rice that's going out. But I think we have an opportunity now to see the whole way that rice uh, farming and, and by extension other smallholder uh, agriculture uh, is being managed to be changed. Uh, we see uh, today uh, a technology that we're rolling out that will allow farmers to get real-time information about what is the best fertilizer to apply on their fields at what time in what formulations. It's only a small step to then see how that, with that information, they can have access to credit. Uh, and again, credit coming through a cell phone. Uh, that access to credit uh, will crack one of the most difficult nuts in, in uh, development that we've had uh, in developing countries uh, over the past decades. Uh, going beyond that, the uh, crop modeling, uh, geographical information systems uh, that are coming together that can be used in, in a real-time way uh, allow us to begin to imagine a crop insurance program that would allow farmers to participate in the credit markets in, in a way that uh, would give them a, a, a level of power and decision making they haven't enjoyed before. And of course, participating in markets uh, in a way that they are, have not traditionally been able to participate. That is empowering them with the price information that Mr. Page talked about. So I think that some of, when we look at uh, how things are changing, for small holders uh, around the world, I think it's, we're on the, on, on the tip of a, of a revolution that we're just beginning to appreciate. So, Jose Fernandez, from, I mean, we're hearing words like uh, tip of the iceberg or tip of the revolution, or, you know, sort of, you know, we're, we're hearing Walmart saying, you know, five years ago they really embarked on a, uh, on a journey. And, uh, and then now they're, they're talking about you know, fairly large figures, you know, sourcing from one million smallholder farmers, you know, one billion dollars worth of uh, supplied goods. I mean, the U.S. has also, in its own way, taken a very strong leadership uh, stake from a government uh, perspective, and that's been very powerful to watch over the last uh, sort of 12, you know, 12 to 18 months. And uh, so, but what do you see as the challenges and you know, the, the successes that need to be emulated going forward in this whole framework of partnership uh, for smallholder farmers to achieve the sort of scale levels we're talking about? Um, thank you, uh, and thanks for having me here. At food security is the reason I left the corporate law, to, um, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. At, and we're very proud of the steps that we're taking uh, to try and deal with, with the food security issue. Um, by no means is it a silver bullet, but I think, to answer your, your question, I think there may be four or five uh, differences in what's been done before to with what we're doing now. And I, I would first of all focus on the scale, uh, the numbers that, that countries are pledging uh, for to, to, uh, to fight uh, food insecurity are unprecedented, and the fact that uh, we're very proud of the fact that, that the U.S. has pledged three and a half billion dollars over the next three years. Uh, and that the rest of the world has pledged 18 billion plus. Um, so that's the scale. This is, is one important aspect of, 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 uh, of the future and, the, and our strategy. The, the whole innovation, the, how we're using technology, how we're trying to leverage partnerships, uh, the fact that it's comprehensive. We're not simply focusing on, on putting seats on the ground, but we're looking at things such as infrastructure, uh, working on markets, including uh, using cell phone technology, uh, looking at gender issues, the fact that in Africa, uh, 70 plus percent of, of the workers on the land are women, but they, in many places, cannot own the land. Uh, so how do you how do you deal with the title issue uh, in these countries? Um, um, technology, uh, including uh, ag biotech, all of these are it's a comprehensive way of addressing the the, the problem, and it's it's also um, uh, another part of the strategy. I would say also is that we're really making sure that, it, that the countries are invested in the, in the, uh, 
in the strategy. They have to be country owned. They have to own it, uh, and that means that some of the some of the steps that we're taking may take a little bit more time to actually be, be implemented. Because one of the things we want to make sure of is that they're owned by the government, that they're that, that they are uh, partners in this in this uh, in this enterprise. And lastly, um, I think at least from the U.S. side. Another different, I suppose, is the fact that it, we're not trying to do everything for everyone. We're focusing on, at this point, 20 countries, countries that we believe, we believe we can make the most difference, difference uh, more countries that have taken steps already to, uh, to take advantage of, of, of the help that we can provide. Countries like Rwanda uh, and, and others uh, in, in Africa, in Asia, and as well as in Latin America. So, I mean, coming back to a point and, uh, that, that was made earlier, and I'm going to ask uh, both uh, Robert and Gabriella this, but I mean, one of the things that struck me uh, in, in listening to your story, just on that sugar beet one, for example, is that there was a very strong link between the research component of it and the industry driving this, uh, and, and then the, the, the link. So you've got a link between the private sector and the industry in that sense, the research and then the farmer and the farmers that you, you represented. Um, I mean, for, for both of you, are you, is this sort of, this is a critical link as I, as I see it, this link between research and the market, uh, between making sure that, you know, that, that link is developed. Is, is that something that you're seeing growing or that you see to have, need to see to have more emphasis in, in, in developing these kinds of partnerships? Well, uh, those kind of partnerships are very important, especially in my country, because research is getting less and less um, things done. Uh, we're facing an enormous crisis, and the government is giving very little money to uh, the uh, public uh, research. So what we are trying to do is mainly between uh, the industries and uh, the farmers, our suppliers and we apply to some of the uh, programs which are funded by the European Union and those um, fund fundamentally the um, experimentation that the research of some other countries um, have um, uh, done. So we don't have much research in our country. What we are trying to do is profiting from the research from other countries that have the same conditions as us, like Spain, uh, Italy, and uh, the United States. In some, uh, like the no-till, for example, we um, tend to uh, use the example and the uh, practices of the United States and South America. Um, but unfortunately, now we cannot uh, rely on the Portuguese uh, research. What we can do is tell the, the market or the industries, we want to do what you want us to do, but we need the support of uh, some institutes abroad, some farmers abroad, and the companies who supply the inputs for us. You're seeing, you're seeing much more virtual partnerships in that sense. This isn't a traditional partnership done in Portugal, developed with Portuguese associations. You're looking much more at, at, at a virtual, international type partnership, but with a very local, specific, tangible result. But, Robert, I mean, from your side, what are you seeing? Well, I think we've just heard an extremely important point uh, being made, and that is the decline of public sector research. Uh, we have uh, we've heard a mantra over the last uh, 20 years or so that the private sector can do everything. Well, the private sector can do an awful lot, but one of the things that it's not particularly good at is a lot of the innovative research uh, that is pre-competitive. It actually goes out to, to, to creating a platform upon which uh, new technologies, new products are, are built. And I think we have to keep in mind that without a vibrant public sector research that I mentioned to our whole overall uh, food security strategy. Over the long run, we're going to run into trouble. Uh, Phil Pardee uh, here at the, at the University of Minnesota has done some outstanding work that's shown that uh, a reduction, uh, a dramatic reduction in investment in public sector research 
uh, will show up as a drying up pipeline after only about 15 years. So you can have a short term cut in, in public spending and research and not see the consequences of that for, for a decade or more, uh, which is a very dangerous scenario when you put that sort of thing in the hands of politicians. Um, now, I think, now having said that, the, uh, there is a very important role for, uh, for the private sector. This is someone who spent his entire life in the public sector. I'm seeing more and more that there is going to be a much more uh, positive contribution by the private sector uh, in its relationship with the public sector. I think there is a, a much more mature relationship uh, uh, that allows us now to enter into the kinds of partnerships that would have been unthinkable uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So, um, Jose Fernandez, I mean, I'm going to come back to this word pre-competitive because, you know, I mean, I come from the private sector, we compete, you know, on, on all levels. Uh, and, uh, and I also yeah. come from the private sector. I've only been in office for nine months, so I feel your pain. Uh, so, um, so, so this notion of pre-competitive, you know, where you're you're seeing companies come together, you know, in a more collective uh, alliance around research, in the way that Robert is describing this. I mean, there's also a challenge there, I would imagine, you know, for the U.S. government about how it supports the private sector. And traditionally, for a lot of the, the international donors and agencies around the world, you know, there, there's, been, there, there's been a difficulty of having this broader alliance, which involves the private sector and, and in that. But with this, is, is it possible to have these kinds of pre-competitive dynamic partnerships that then you know, later lead to, to more market uh, competition issues later on? I think it's critical. I think you have to have um, in fact, one of the things that we're trying to do, uh, one of the reasons why I'm here, is I'm trying to, to find ways to create alliances uh, with the private sector. Because at the end of the day, um, uh, this cannot be a charitable enterprise. It's got to be. Uh, it's got to be a confluence of, um, of development and, and dollars, development and profit. That's the only way that I believe we can make something that will be lasting. And so what we're trying to do is to, is to find ways to work with the private sector, to find ways uh, to, to interest companies uh, to go into some of these markets, to go into Africa, to, to go to some of these countries. And what I'm seeing so far is actually quite encouraging. I had expected to get a lot of responses uh, that I've gotten in other industries uh, that, that would say, well, we're really not interested in going, going into this part of Africa because there's not much of a market there. Well, the fact of the matter is, that at least what I'm hearing from many companies is that yes, they would welcome uh, a partnership, a, a collaboration with uh, the U.S., with, with the universities, with civil society, to try and open some of these markets, and that in fact, uh, many of them are already looking at ways to do so. So uh, I'm encouraged, and I frankly believe it's the only it's the, it's the only way that this thing is going to work. This is not going to be led. It can be facilitated and maybe galvanized by government, but it cannot be done by government. 